Good morning, Smoky Mountain. Good morning. God is good all the time. Hey, Amen. God bless you all for being here this morning, for visiting with us today. We're sure glad you're with us. You're watching us online. Thank you for tuning in as well. And the chairs in front of you, there should be like a little blue card. If you could just take a moment and fill it out, drop that in the offering plate when it comes by. We sure would appreciate that. Just so have a record of you being here and kind of every now and then give you an update on what's going on at Smoky Mountain. If you're a regular attendee, need to update your personal information or uh, have a prayer request, uh, drop that in there as well. And I do see those and I do make note of those each and every week as, as, as well. A few quick announcements this morning before we get started. I want to remind you all that Wednesday night at 6.30 we do have youth group as well as Bible study. We'll continue our study of the book of Daniel Wednesday night at 6.30. Next Saturday, uh, elders, deacons, trustees, we do have our, our leadership meeting at 8 o'clock. Here at, the, here at the church uh, next Saturday. Uh, for the month of January, I guess we only got a couple days left on this, but for Sevier County Food Ministries, we're collecting uh, uh, peanut butter, jelly, instant oatmeal, and Little Debbie snack cakes. And I'm sure next week we'll have a, a new list for you all to, to donate to that. So that's pretty much what's going on today. Let's all, let's all stand. And uh, let's, let's open the word of prayer as we prepare to go into our... Okay. Let's pray. Father God, it's so good to be in this place, Lord. It's a beautiful, sunshiny day, God, and we thank you for that, God. We thank you for your goodness and your grace and your love you showed to us in so many different great ways, God. We pray that you be with those who cannot be here with us today, Lord, those who are traveling. I pray that you give them safety in their journeys back and forth. Those who've traveled to us for some time in the Smokies, I pray that their time is relaxing and, and re-energize them, ready to go back home and tackle their jobs and their church and, and, and your work there that they have for them, God. God, we pray that you'll be with us. We go through the service today, Lord. I pray our attitudes, our actions, our worship will be a blessing to you, will honor you, will glorify you, that make you say, those are my children, and, and I'm so proud of them, God. And I pray that your spirit will come move in and through this place and through us, God, and convict us, remind us, encourage us with those things, Lord, that just... Uh, can, can glorify, glorify you and help us to better serve you. God, we, we love you. We thank you for this time. It's in your precious son's name we pray. And all of God's people said. Amen. Good morning. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 95.1. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Grace and mercy. 
We thank you for this time that we've had to join together in worshiping you. Uh, the song we just sang, I think, is very special to a lot of us. It makes us feel very close to you. I pray that in the, in the time of the sermon that we will keep that closeness and truly hear the words that you are speaking to us through Brian and that we will take them to heart. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our young people may be Dismiss. So. I love weddings. And in my 25 years of, of ministry or so, I've, I've had the privilege of conducting about 50 or so weddings, which have brought me some of my, some of my greatest joys in, in ministry. But before any of these weddings, I will sit down with the bride and groom and 
what we call premarital counseling. And many of you went through that. And among the many things that I will tell them, is one of the most important things I will tell them is that it's much easier to plan a great wedding than it is to have a great marriage. And then we'll spend the next three or four sessions talking about what it looks like to have a good, godly Christian marriage. However, towards the end of our last session, I will always allow a little bit of time to talk about the wedding ceremony itself because every young bride has this dream, this deep, beautiful desire to have that perfect wedding. Now, I don't want to crush these young brides' hearts, so I will always advise them to expect the unexpected because you never really know what could happen. For example, I read about a certain couple who had planned every detail of their wedding months in advance. The rehearsal time came and everything, they went through the ceremony three or four times and, and everything was going perfect. They wanted to have this perfect wedding and the wedding day arrived, the wedding time arrived and, and, and their pastor could tell that the groom was, was a little bit nervous. And, but the groom assured the pastor that he was, he was going to be all right. And once the wedding got started, everything was going as planned until the pastor's first few words. And the pastor looked at the groom and, and he was pale. And just like that, he hit the floor. And needless to say, the bride was a shock, as well as many other people at the wedding that day. And the pastor stopped the ceremony, of course, and, and, and uh, he helped the, the groom regain his consciousness. And, and the groom said he'd be all right. And so they, they, he resumed the service. And, and the pastor got very few words out. And just like that, boom, he was down again. Well, well, this time, the, the, the pastor, you know, everybody was beginning to smile at this and kind of smirk a little bit. And at this time, the pastor asked that they bring a chair in and have him sit in that chair and put a wet cloth over his forehead. And, and so, you know, he started the ceremony back up, and he was a few words into it. And before he get a few words into it, he passed out again. And he would have fell out of his chair if somebody had caught him. And at this point, the, he helped him regain consciousness. And the pastor knew that this young man could not handle the pressure of a full wedding ceremony. So he simply said, say, I do. And the groom said, I do. And he said, you're married. And a big grin appeared on his face. He stood up, kissed the bride, and everything was good from, from that point on. Weddings are always exciting because you never really know what to expect. An author and preacher named Robert Fulgham tells the story about a wedding that he presided over that was unlike any wedding he'd ever been a part of. And he said there was an 18-piece instrument ensemble on stage, 25 bridesmaids and groomsmen. He said it was like the invasion of a small nation. And all was orchestrated by the woman he referred to as the M.O.B., Mother of the Bride. But he said the climax of the entire wedding didn't start until the processional began. And then he writes, ah, the bride. She'd been dressed for hours, if not days. And there wasn't an ounce of adrenaline left in her body. She was waiting with her dad and she aimed her sights at the reception food table. She began with those little mints. And as they were waiting for their time to come down the aisle, she began to pick through the bowl of mixed nuts, decided to dive into the real food, the cheese balls and the sausage with toothpicks and the little paint and some little shrimp topped the things off very well. To wash it all down, the dad gave her a glass of pink champagne. The doors were thrown wide open, and as the bride stood in the doorway, what you noticed was not her dress, but her face. Just as white, not nearly. That's pretty. What came down the aisle was not a bride, but a living grenade with the pen pulled out of it. As the bride came down the aisle, she passed her smiling, doting, proud mother. But then she began to wobble, swaying back and forth in front of the church. And then she lost it. The bride threw up. And by threw up, I don't mean a plight little lady like burp into a handkerchief. No, there's no nice way to put this. She hosed the entire front of the church. Bridesmaids were scattering, the ring bearer diving for cover. The only person smiling was the mother of the groom. 
But the best part of the story is that 10 years later, everyone got together to celebrate this disaster of a wedding. Three large television screens were set up. They popped in the tape. Everyone watched this awful ceremony unfold, laughed at one another as they watched it. I guess my question about that story would be, how could they celebrate such a disaster of a wedding? And the answer is they knew at the end of the day the bride still got the groom, and that was all that mattered, which brings us to today's text. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you use the Bible app on your phone or device, open them with me to Matthew chapter 25. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 13, where Jesus tells a story about a wedding with a few unexpected twists. For example, I think most of you know that most weddings tend to focus on the bride, right? She's the centerpiece of the wedding. All plans are made to ensure that she has a very special occasion. However, in this story of Jesus, it is the bridegroom and especially the bridesmaids who are central to the story. And it's a story about being ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. If you're visiting with us today or been away for a couple weeks or watching this online, we've been in this series of sermons from Matthew chapters 24 and 25 called The Return of Our King, Living Ready for the Second Coming of Christ. These two chapters of, of, of Matthew's gospel have been perhaps some of the most mysterious, controversial, all, all, um, important sections of Matthew's gospel, if not the entire New Testament. And throughout this series, we've been talking about what to expect when Jesus comes back. Now, at times, I said last week, this series has been a little head-spinning for me, but I think the biggest takeaway thus far has been that no one knows when it's going to happen, which is kind of a foreboding thought for many of us. Because let's be honest, we like to be in the know, right? When things are going to happen, how they're going to happen, and why they're going to happen, the way they're happening, but over and over again in Matthew 24, made it clear to us that no one knows the day or the hour for when the Son of Man will return and take us home. Well, in Matthew 25, where we're going to be today, Jesus goes from talking about the signs of the times and what to expect just before Christ comes back to the importance of wedding. In verse 1 of today's text, Jesus refers to a very familiar pattern of teaching that he's used many times when he was teaching in God, the Gospel of Matthew, where he says, verse 1, time of heaven will be like. Then he tells three stories that all speak to this idea of being vigilant and ready for the return of Christ. Now if you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write this first point down. I think it's probably kind of the main point of the entire story. And then we'll read the story. Write this down. Jesus deeply hopes that you are ready for him to return. Let's look at the story, Matthew 25. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet who? Meet who? The bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. That's not very smart, is it? The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. That's why they're wise. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry went out, here's the what? Bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones, remember those ones that didn't have enough oil, they said to the some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to someone who sells oil. I mean, Walmart's open 24 hours a day, at least it used to be, right? And so they're on their way, and so they go, they go to buy some oil on their, on, on their own. And, 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 but while they're on their way, while the foolish ones are on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went into the wedding banquet, and the door was what? The door was shut, closed. Later, the others, the five foolish ones, also came and they said, Sir, sir, some translations might say, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. And then verse 13 provides, Jesus provides his own commentary on, on, on this. And he says, therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. 
Now, the challenge of reading the New Testament or the entire Bible in general for us is that we are separated by some 2,000 years from the story. And so as we're reading this story, we might be thinking, oh, wait a minute, preacher, I, I don't get it. I mean, I've been to some weddings. I've, I've been in a couple weddings. As a preacher, I've performed a few weddings, but I don't get the whole ten virgins, bridegroom coming thing. Well, since we don't understand this historically, let me give you this morning a little first century wedding tutorial. Obviously, the first century wedding customs were very different from today's practices and customs. Perhaps one of the biggest difference was that in the first century, wedding ceremonies, festivities lasted for an entire week. We do it in about two days. But not only that, first century weddings were arranged marriages. Now, you may not like that. I mean, especially in today's culture, that's just the way it was. And so one dad would say to the other dad, hey, can my son have your daughter in marriage? These two dads would begin to negotiate a price, a bridal price. And, and then maybe a camel, you know, donkeys, a little bit of cash, a little bit of speak. And, and, and you're thinking, seriously? Seriously. And then once the bridal price was set, they were considered engaged betrothed, think Mary and Joseph, and then before the wedding could ever take place, the bridegroom would go and make ready a house that he and his bride would live in because you, you couldn't be married until you had a place to live. And so the bridegroom would go, uh, sometimes if he lived in another town, he'd go far away, maybe just go down the street and, and where he lived, and he'd, he'd, and he'd prepare a place for them to live their life together. Now, if you were poor, you might build on your parents' property. You might just add a room onto your, your, your parents' house. But nonetheless, the, the primary responsibility of the, of the bridegroom was to get a house ready before they could be married. Now, because there was no save-the-date kind of thing going on, there weren't cell phones, there wasn't, you know, you know, there wasn't you know, text messaging, there was no, no way of knowing you know, just, when, just when to expect the bridegroom. Normally, he would show up at nighttime because it kind of heightened the element of surprise. So the bride would be in her parents' house, not sure when her bridegroom would arrive, but then all of a sudden, someone would announce with a shout, the bridegroom was on his way and he could arrive at any point. Now, if that thought of mine, it's interesting how we see throughout scriptures that midnight is often with both, when both deliverance and judgment comes. And maybe that's why the ancient rabbis used to say the Messiah will come at midnight. I mean, Jesus himself said he could come like a thief in the night and when we least expect him. And according to Jesus and the Apostle Paul, there'll be a loud trumpet call. So the coming will not be silent. Everyone is going to hear it, see it, and know it when it happens. But don't miss this next detail. The bridegroom and his entourage would enter the bride's parents' home and take her and her bridal party back to his house that he's been fixing up where the wedding festivities would then begin. And by the way, all of that is symbolic to say how one day, surprise, Jesus is going to return a second time and we'll hear the words, the bridegroom cometh, and then Jesus is going to come and take us, his church, the bride, back to his house where the festivities will begin. And it won't just last for a week or a couple of days. It's going to last for all eternity. Can I get an oh yeah? Can I get an oh yeah? All right, getting back to our story. As soon as the bridegroom arrived, that is when the wedding celebration would start. In other words, the bridegroom would go to the bride's parents' house where he's greeted by her parents. There would be a ceremony of transfer similar to what many of us have witnessed right here at the front of a church aisle. I've seen numerous fathers put the hand of his daughter into the hand of his son-in-law-to-be. And then, then there would be a, per, a procession of virgins and bridesmaids, people with lamps, who would proceed from the bride's house to the house of the bridegroom is prepared. And then once they get there, the celebration would begin. It would last for anywhere from a week to an entire month. And those of you who have paid for your kids' weddings, any of you in this room paid for your kids' weddings? Some of you, all right, a little bit. You know it's expensive, right? And you want to make sure that there's enough money for food and drink for, for everybody, right? Same thing in the first century. 
except it would have lasted for a whole week or longer. Imagine paying for that one, all right? This would be kicked off by a procession of lights and dancing and music and ceremony. So that's the kind of celebration Jesus is talking about in Matthew 25. As he's talking about these ten virgins, these ten bridesmaids, these ten, these ten maidens who got their lamps are part of this grand procession that would take place. Now, who are these ten virgins Jesus is talking about? Well, in the first century, girls would get married very young, teenagers usually, sometimes 13, 14 years old, and, and all the bridesmaids would, would be, they'd be virgins as well, you know, and you wouldn't get married if you weren't a bridesmaid, that, or weren't virgin back then, it's just the way it was, and, and there also was no street lamps, right? And so, and there was customarily 10 bridesmaids. Today, the number of bridesmaids may vary, right? And, and what are they doing there? I mean, today, what, what are the bridesmaids doing? Well, if you think about it, they really don't do much of anything except look pretty and hold flowers, right? Because we've got this modern thing called electricity. But back in those days, those ten bridesmaids would take their lamps. Those lamps would light the way back to the bridegroom's house. Now imagine, verse 6 of our text, that you're the the bride's parents' house waiting for the groom. It's midnight, so you've basically given up on the idea that he's going to show up tonight, when all of a sudden there's a cry that rings out, here comes the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. And then the virgins are all awakened by the announcement, the sudden realization that they've got a job to do because they've got to light the way. And so in Jesus' story, there were five wise ones, five foolish ones. And of course, the five foolish ones did not have enough oil for their lamps to stay lit. So they asked the five wise ones, can we borrow some of yours? And they said, no, because if we give you some of ours, then none of us will have enough. And, and why don't you go buy some? And so while they're off buying oil for their lamps, the bridegroom himself arrives. And they went inside the banquet hall, and the Bible says the door was shut. You know, those five words, and the door was shut, might just be the five saddest words in all of Scripture. Because in the context of Jesus' parable, when the doors to the marriage celebration were shut, they would not be reopened to anyone. In fact, in the Greek language, a more literal interpretation might be, and the door was shut to stay shut. Listen, church, if we are not ready when the bridegroom Jesus comes, the door will be shut And he will begin the celebration without us. And what a tragedy it would be for us to have lived our entire lives in anticipation of his coming. And then to be shut out because of insufficient preparations that were made. And so if there's just one lesson that I can burn upon your consciousness this morning, let it be this. Don't let the door shut with you on the outside. Because heaven will be too sweet, as we talked about last week, and hell will be too long and too terrible for us to be unprepared to enter the banquet hall when the bridegroom calls to his eternal feast. And so, friends, the whole story, the whole point of the story is that someday, hopefully sooner than later, Jesus Christ is going to come back, which begs the question of, if he came back today, if he came back before this long-winded preacher is done preaching, are you prepared? In fact, if you're taking notes, the most important area of preparation in life often overlooked is eternal preparation. I mean, we understand the importance of preparation in many areas of life because we prepare to take a test through studying. We prepare for a career through education and apprenticeships. We prepare for surgery through various tests and procedures and consultations designed to prep us for the surgery. We prepare for the birth of a child through doctor's visits, prenatal practices, accumulating the necessary things for a baby like cradles and blankets and diapers. We prepare to buy a house through hours of searching and filling out the loan applications and the paperwork, packing and unpacking countless moving boxes. So no one is going to argue with the necessary steps in being prepared, but the most important area of preparation in life is eternal preparation. 
I'm not talking about have you done enough good deeds, but have you named Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Uh, have you been obedient to Him in Christian baptism? Are you following Jesus right now with all your heart, so much so that if Jesus came this minute, you wouldn't be surprised because you've been anticipating Him all along? Would you be like those five foolish women who, who woke up in a frantic unready state, had to hurry off to find some oil, but it's too late. Jeff and Janelle were about to go out on their first date. And Janelle was expecting Jeff to show up at 6 p.m. She was all dressed up, her hair was done, she was ready to go, her makeup was done. But two hours later, Jeff had still not showed up. Well, now it was about 8 p.m., and Janelle figured that she'd been stood up, and so she removed her makeup, put on her pajamas, grabbed some junk food, sat down on her couch with her dog, and began to watch her favorite television show. As her favorite show was coming to an end, the doorbell rang, and it was, guess who? Jeff. And he looked at her, and he said, I'm three hours late, and you're still not ready? Some people think that Jesus is late and he's not coming. Some people think he's coming, just not anytime soon, so I've got plenty of time to get ready. Then some people think that someday I'm going to get ready, but I'm just not going to get ready today. And some people think there is no God, so it does not matter if I'm ready because he's not coming. May I remind you that Hebrews chapter 9, 27 and 28 says, Just as man is destined to die once, after that to face the judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And the Bible says he'll appear a second time, not to bear sin. He took care of that the first time. The second time he's coming to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So we're taking notes, brings us to this. Secondly... Jesus wants us to know that everyone, say everyone, everyone is invited. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not, but Jesus uses this imagery of a wedding feast to teach us about his coming kingdom. There's obviously a marriage wedding thing going on in the scriptures and when it comes to our relationship with God, which is not by chance because God doesn't sit up in heaven and say, well, let's, 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 uh, let's try this and see what happens. No, God has a divine plan. In order to everything that he has said and does in the scriptures. And so it's not by coincidence that Jesus' very first miracle was at a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee in John chapter 2. Now, uh, what I'm about to say next isn't necessarily a part of today's sermon, but I think it's worth noting here that Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine at a wedding feast. About three and a half years later... He'll sit around a communion table with his disciples in an upper room in Jerusalem and in essence say, this is my wine, this wine is my blood shed for you and I'm going to drink this again someday where? The wedding feast of the Lamb in heaven. But not only that, there are numerous allusions to weddings in the New Testament. For example, earlier this year, we considered Matthew 22, where Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. Last week, we considered John chapter 14, where Jesus informed his disciples that he was leaving, and he reassured them by saying, do not let your heart be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. And he in essence was saying, I am the bridegroom. I'm going to go and get us ready, a, an eternal home, and I'm going to come back to get you, and, which is just the way it happened in the first century. And, and of course, there are those words of Revelation 19, 9, which says, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Now, with that thought of mine, let's just stop here for a moment as we're considering the story that Jesus told in Matthew 25 and again say that, that we're like these ten virgins in this way. Everyone is invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Listen, all ten of these gals were invited. They all were invited to a wedding. They all were supposed to be a part of the wedding. And if you're here today or watching online and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, I can tell you by the authority of Jesus Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection that you are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb that he's preparing for us right now. 
Now, with that being said, there's a couple things we need to be reminded of. The first one should be obvious by now. If you're taking notes, Jesus is the bridegroom. Which means in his story, he's talking about himself. He's coming for a wedding and to get all the people that he loves and take them to the eternal home. He's prepared for them. In fact, if we were to look at the Old Testament, there's some really cool passages like Isaiah 62, 5, which says, As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. How beautiful and cool is that? God loves you like a guy who's getting ready to get married and tomorrow is his wedding day. And God loves you with that kind of anticipation and excitement and passion. But you were taking notes, number two, when the, celebra- when the bridegroom arrives, the celebration begins. Which also marks the end of the world as we know it, the beginning of the eternal kingdom of God, when the heavenly bridegroom will get his bride, the church. Listen, church, we don't have to be Bible scholars to understand that we don't know when Jesus is coming. We have no idea. We have a few ideas. We have a few hints. We've looked at some stuff over the past few weeks in Matthew 24 that we can conclude that we're living in the end times. But like the ten virgins of today's text, we know that, you know, we know the bridegroom's coming. We, We don't know when the bridegroom is coming, and we know that it will not be when we expect it. That message is true, then the message is crystal clear. If any day could be the day, and any time be the time, then we should be ready all day, every day, all the time. That's what we're supposed to be ready. And that's what Jesus is trying to communicate because these five foolish ones were not ready. Now let's just back up. Be reminded of something. How many virgins were initially invited to the wedding feast? Ten. Right. How many of them initially had lamps and oil in their lamps? Ten, initially. How many of them were most likely friends of the bride? Ten. How many of them were most likely known by the bridegroom? Ten. See a pattern here? But... How many of them actually went into the wedding feast? Five. This is not a sermon meant to scare you, but when we hear a story like this, that Jesus says at the end, it's going to be like this, ten are invited, only five get in. We should sit up and say, this, let's pay attention. Why didn't those five get in? The Bible says the five didn't get in because they were foolish. The door was already shut, which begs the question, what made them foolish? need to pay attention to this because if they were foolish, listen, church, if they were foolish, then then perhaps we could be foolish. So let's not be foolish, right? Instead of taking notes, thirdly, Jesus wants us to know that too little preparation and too much presumption could result in denied deliverance. As I was studying this week, I realized there's a lot of debate among theologians about what the oil or lack of oil represents. Let me quickly offer up three possibilities. Number one, if you're taking notes, lack of oil could represent taking your relationship with the bridegroom for granted, taking it too lightly. In fact, in this story, they ran off to buy oil for the lamp since they ran out. And as a result, they get back to the party late. So they knock on the door and they say, hey, we're the five virgins. We're still your friends. We know you. We grew up with you. But he says, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. Don't miss it. If you still got your Bible, it opens verse 11 of our text. Depending on what version you're reading from, those five girls called him, Lord, Lord. You know us. We call you Lord. We're in a relationship with you. And he answers back, I don't know you, which is probably not to be taken literally. It's most likely a Hebrew idiom that more accurately says, hear this, I disown you. I don't know which is worse. I disown you. I never knew you. I disown you. You guys didn't take enough time to care about our relationship, to bring extra oil, to make sure you get into the wedding. And if you don't care about being in the wedding, then I don't care about you being in the wedding. You're out. Perhaps. Jesus is saying to us that some of us can be like these five foolish girls who don't bring enough oil 
meaning that we take our relationship with God too lightly. We take it for granted. I mean, listen, church, we say things like, I can do whatever I want. God will forgive me. I've been a Christian for a really long time, so God's grace is going to cover me. And by the way, those are all true things. But when we begin to take for granted the relationship we have with the bridegroom, there is a chance, church, that we are acting foolishly. You know what a fool says is means? It says that there, it means there is no God, basically. Listen, do you know why these five virgins brought the five wise ones brought extra oils because they love the bride. They love the bridegroom so much so they were like, I'm not missing out on this. I'm not running out. I'm not taking for granted that they know me, that I've got an inside track. So I'm going to be prepared because I love him. So the lack of oil could represent taking the bridegroom for granted, taking him too lightly. Or if you're taking notes, number two, the lack of oil could represent a I'm a good enough, I'm good enough attitude. Listen, the five foolish girls had lamps and they waited until midnight, which says to me that they were excited about being in the wedding. They probably had special wedding garments on. They did their makeup. They did their hair. They had some kind of relationship with the bridegroom. But here's what they didn't do. They didn't prepare by taking extra oil. Whereas the five wiser girls thought so highly of the bridegroom that they in essence said, I would do anything to make sure my lamp is burning when the bridegroom gets here. Church, there's a sermon in there somewhere for you. Amen? I'll do whatever it takes. I'll work at it. Maybe, church, this is like some of us in this room or watching online who are Christians. You go to church, but you're not really committed to following Christ. I mean, you're here today, but you're not really giving. Your name is on a membership roll, and you know you should be serving somewhere, but you're not serving anywhere. You're just kind of here. Maybe we're becoming like the, the growing number of Christians in America pre-pandemic. So I can imagine these numbers are worse than that now. Pre-pandemic who think 1.2 times a month is enough to be in church. That's when you'll see me. That's how I'll do it. What you're really saying is, you know what, I'm not really that concerned about what about that day. I've kind of said I'm good enough, period. Taking notes, number three. And all three of these kind of go together. Maybe the lack of oil represents the lack of the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. All throughout the scriptures, the Holy Spirit symbolized by oil, because we talked about this back at Christmas time. If you poured oil on a prophet, priest, or king, then that was the anointing of the Holy Spirit. If you pour oil over some sacred spot, that was the anointing of dedication. If you are in Christ, the Holy Spirit is God's anointing on you. It's God's personal seal on you, Ephesians 1.13. So apparently there's something in this story of Jesus about the connection between the Holy Spirit and the oil. And this may be a stretch, but perhaps the lack of oil represents Christ followers, some of us who have acknowledged Jesus as our Savior, but not as our Lord. Like those girls who said, Lord, Lord. In other words, they're not yielding to the Holy Spirit's work in their life and keeping his flame burning, shine, Jesus shine in, in their life's lamp. In fact, the Bible teaches that if you lack the Holy Spirit, listen to this, if you lack the Holy Spirit, you don't genuinely belong to Christ's bridal party. It's not enough to belong to a local church. You must belong to Christ himself. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verses 9 and 10, If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. The Holy Spirit is what gives life to your mortal body. To use Jesus' metaphor, the Holy Spirit is the oil that gives light to your life so that it can shine brightly as a testimony that you belong to Christ. How do you get the Holy Spirit? Now, we can do a whole sermon on this, but Jesus made it pretty simple. He said to ask. He said in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give what? Give what? 
the Holy Spirit to those who what? Ask him. Jesus said it, not me. The well-known author and communicator Francis Chan talks about a time when his teenage daughter was not in love with, with Jesus. And like a good Christian father would do, he spent the nights crying about it, praying about his daughter's relationship with the Lord, and he said, here I am, knowing for my ability to communicate, but there's nothing that I could do for my daughter that would make her fall in love with Jesus. He prayed, God, either your spirit comes into her or your spirit doesn't. It doesn't matter how great of a dad I am, I cannot bring her to life. Finally, one day, she came to her dad and she said, Dad, you're right. The Holy Spirit was not in me, but now he is. And she talked about how much closer to God she was feeling and how everything was changing for her. But, of course, Francis Chan and his wife were a little bit skeptical. They wanted to see some evidence. They wanted to see the fruit of the change of her life, the fruit of the Spirit in her, and, 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 and to see the evidence of changes in her life, which they did in the days and weeks and months to follow. And then Francis Chan said, I didn't do that. It was the Holy Spirit. Friends, even if your dad is a well-known and effective communicator, you still need the Holy Spirit within you to make a real difference. No number of sermons can change your life because only God's Spirit can so, so move beyond simply listening to sermons in church to inviting God's Spirit to dwell in you and through you. Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, and I quote, What lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. When the Holy Spirit lies within you, your past doesn't have to define you anymore. Your challenges can be easily overcome. And when he changes you from the inside out, the light of your life will be able to shine brightly in a dark and dreary world. And in that way, you'll be ready to meet Jesus, the bridegroom, when he comes again. Let's take one last look at our story today. Getting back to the story of these five foolish gals, they're, they're there. They had their lamps. The bride was, broom was coming, but they let their lights go out. And Jesus said in verse 13 of our text, if you still got your Bibles open, it's a warning to all of us, it's a warning to me as your pastor, it's a warning to you in this room. It's a warning to those of you watching us online today, whether you're a brand new Christian or you're a veteran in the faith. It doesn't matter because listen to what Jesus said in verse 13. Therefore, keep watch. Be ready. Be vigilant. Make sure that when the bridegroom arrives that your lamp is burning. Don't run out of oil. Keep an eye on your oil level because when you're out of oil, the light goes out and you are out. Door shut. Now listen, church, I would love to make this sermon easier and say, just kidding. They went to the market. They got more oil. Their lights came back on. The bridegroom lets them in and everybody lives happily ever after. That's not how Jesus tells the story. So I'm sticking with his script. And say there are only five. There are 62 of us in this, morning, in this room this morning. Is it possible only 31 of us will get in? Look again at verse 10 of our text. While they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Those who were ready got to be part of the celebration. In other words, when the bridegroom arrived, their lamps were burning, their lights were bright. They could see clearly, and they were part of the procession that celebrated. And Jesus' story is obviously that he wants that outcome for all of his followers. And so let me say it again. It saddens the bridegroom that five weren't ready and didn't come in. Listen, they all were invited. They were all loved. 
They were all died for. They all could have been a part of the celebration, which begs the question, will your story be their story? As I was working on this sermon this week, I was reminded of an old saying, and probably all the brides in this room or wannabe brides in this room might know this saying, it's always a bridesmaid, never a bride. It's a way of saying I'm tired of being a bridesmaid. I'm tired of being a virgin with the lamp. I want to be married. That's actually how this sermon ends because maybe you're sitting here this morning thinking, I don't want to be a bridesmaid. I want to be a bride. And here's the surprise ending of this wedding story. You are, church. You are the bride. You see, the twist at the end here is that the groom is not coming back to be escorted by us. Into the, in a, with a procession of lamps. Rather, he's coming back to get us. He's coming back to take us home. He's coming back for us. Can I get an oh yeah? yeah? And Revelation 19 gives this glorious glimpse of an eternal wedding day when the groom returns because it says, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Listen, the bride is ready because the bride John is talking about is his church, his church. And when he comes back, he's going to take her, his church, home. And I love what it says here. The bride was, made herself ready. Fine linen, bright clothes were given to her to wear. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. I started off by saying I've done a lot of weddings in my 25 years of ministry. I've, lost a, I've watched a lot of brides come down the aisle. Can I tell you something about all the brides I've seen? I've never, ever seen a bride that was not beautiful. One of my favorite things to do is to watch the groom and watch his reaction when he sees the bride for the first time. But not only that, whenever I see a bride walking down the aisle... I like to picture you and me coming down the aisle. What I know about brides is they're, they're beautiful because the groom loves them so much, and the bride knows they're secure in that, which is how it is for us in Christ Jesus. But you know what else the bride knows? They work at getting ready. I mean, sometimes they start months in advance. Working out, they start tanning, they start doing things with their skin. It's amazing. It's amazing. And then on the day of the wedding, it may be a 4 o'clock wedding, but they're at the church by 7 a.m. getting their hair done, putting their makeup on, getting their nails done, getting their dress on. Incredible care is taken to look beautiful for the groom, because not because you're trying to impress the groom. He's already impressed. But because you want to look beautiful on your wedding day. Guys, let's be honest. Perhaps you can't understand this as much from a guy's perspective. But it doesn't change the fact that it's how Jesus wants us to approach this eternal wedding celebration. He's given us permission to look good. To wear some clean clothes by his death, burial, and resurrection. By his blood that washes us clean. Listen, we can never be beautiful. We can never be beautiful enough unless he had done that for us. But at the same time, he, is, he said he, we have been granted to clothe ourselves to look beautiful. So let's look beautiful. Church, let's be as beautiful as we can. Jesus has said, get ready, bride. Get ready, church. Watch. Stay vigilant. Keep your lamp burning. Because the bridegroom is coming. And when he arrives, celebration begins. Amen? Let's stand. Father, God, we come before you this morning just thanking you for this incredible message that you've given to us, that Jesus preached more than 2,000 years ago. God, it's a beautiful image. The church, the bride, you coming to get us. God, may we be ready. May we be ready. 
It would be a sanctuary, pure and holy and beautiful for you, the glorious bridegroom. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. Why don't you come this morning as we sing this song, Sanctuary. Maybe it's the first time you sit and say that I believe that Jesus is the Christ. Maybe you want to join the membership here at Smoky Mountain Christian Church. Maybe you just need some prayers or some concerns this morning. You want to celebrate something. Why don't you come and sing this song, Bride, the Church, Sanctuary. Why don't you? Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me. Good morning. In preparation for our time of communion, which is so much a part of what our service is all about, consider the scriptures that we find in the book of Luke, where we find Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. Having spent time those last hours before his crucifixion to share a meal very important meal, the Last Supper, it's often referred to as. But today we refer to it oftentimes as communion time, a time to commune with God. And as we think about that relationship we have in this time in the worship, let us not forget that Christ himself needed that communion with the Father the one who had sent him for a very special, special service, a very special need for the world filled with sin. And that need is still needed today as well. But he needed help. And so he went to the garden. And in Luke there in chapter 22, we read these words beginning in verse 39 and following. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw. knelt down and prayed. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him fully. 
And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them sleeping, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray that you will not fall into temptation. As we think about those words this, this morning, this time of worship, I'm reminded of a quote from a Mother Teresa in which she said, prayer is the mortar that holds our bodies together. And truly it is. You see, when we go back to the Garden of Gethsemane and we look at where Christ was at that time in anguish, he needed to be strengthened. He needed the help that God can give him, yet he realized that his purpose for coming into this fallen world was to die for the sins of the world. He needed help. And he received that help. And he left that garden ready to face that trial that he was about to face, to be arrested, to be mistreated, to go to the cross for the sins of the whole world. And that was the heaviest burden he ever had to do, to bear those sins for you, for me. And so you may ask yourself, why, why do we here at this church consider communion such an important part of it? For simply the same reason. We are sinners that Christ came to save. We are sinners saved by grace. And so we come to the communion for strength, for the help we need. As we bear the burdens of this life, to face the temptations and to overcome them, we need strength. And so like Jesus, we pray. And so like Jesus, we, we ask for help. And so like Jesus, we take the bread and the cup that he was to bear and we are to bear as he did. And we take communion to remember what he did for us. It was one of the greatest sacrifices that anyone could make for us. And so this morning, take of the, the bread, take of the cup, and let it be a reminder of what Christ went through for you. Yes, take it personally for you as well as for the whole world. May God bless you this morning as you approach the communion in that way. For we need that help and we need that strength that Christ only can give us. God bless you as we take in his name this day. Let us pray. Father, we come before you in this time of communion, recognizing what you went for, uh, through for each of us, the suffering that you experienced, the anguish you felt in that time of prayer in that garden. Yes, you wanted to walk away from it. That human side of you spoke, but your divine side and the help from God, the Father, pushed you forward to do what you came to do. May we in our life, in our acceptance of you in our life, do what you ask us to do and take of this bread and cup and remember, remember fully what Jesus said as often as you partake 
of this cup and of this bread. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to do just that this day and every day. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and blessed Savior. Amen. As we proceed further in our worship service this morning, the church oftentimes is in need of help from those who are a part of the church. And so we bring before us this day that the time of offering, a time to support the work that must go on, and that's what it's really all about. 
not only do you support the preacher, not only do you support the activities of the church, but you also support the work that Christ may pre be presented to a world that does not know him, but we know him. And so from the bottoms of our heart, as he made the sacrifice for each of us, we as well make the sacrifice and the giving of our offerings. And may it be not only an offering that we give because it is the practice of the church, but that it is an offering that comes deep within the heart because that's what Christ did for us. It came deep from the love that resided within the deepness of his heart. May your blessing be blessed in a way that your offerings are received in the manner God desires. For truly, that's what he wants from you. Let us go to him in prayer and pray for that to be. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to present to you our offerings that not only the work of this church may go on, but that the word of Christ, the work of Christ, is presented in a manner worthy. Father, rather it be those who are poor and in need, rather it be the missionaries, whatever it may be, may your word be supported fully by those who give and make that sacrifice. So bless the offering and bless the work of this church. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join us in song as we give our offerings to the Lord. for being with us today in worship. We pray that you all have a good week and don't forget to keep ready. <laughs>